Thank you for joining me for another episode of Sam's Tech Stuff. Today we'll be taking a look at my custom-built virtualization server that I run VMware ESXi 6.7 on in my home lab. Looking at this server, you might be wondering why I spent a good chunk of money on it or built it in the first place. There were quite a few reasons that I ended up building this. Mainly, I wanted to create a practice lab environment for studying for future exams. And I also wanted to move some of the dedicated tasks off of my main and secondary PC to a centralized server. I didn't like tying up both my PCs for days or weeks on end, since I do game and edit videos for the channel with both of them. In today's video, we'll take a look at mainly the hardware choices that I made for the build. Before we get to that, if you're interested in server or gaming PC builds, like this one or my last gaming PC build, Get subscribed to the channel and click that bell icon below the video for notifications when new videos land on the channel. If you want to support the channel, check out the Amazon affiliate links in the description below when shopping on Amazon. This helps the channel earn some income and it's free to use for you. So here is the ESXi server that I'm currently using. Some of you might remember this from an older video where it used to perform a relatively compute heavy workload before it converted it back into a hypervisor. I knew from the beginning of this project that I was definitely going to utilize a bunch of PCIe pass-through cards for different VMs. So when I picked the case, I knew that I had to go with a 4U tall case. A 4U tall case would allow me to buy the standard version of graphics cards or any other PCI card and fit it right in the case without any modification. And these PCIe devices tend to be a lot cheaper than the miniature versions. So each one of the server cases is measured in U or RU. These are basically called rack units. So this server is four RU tall. Each RU is about 1.75 inches. In order to fit everything that I needed and have a little bit of room for expansion in the future, it was clear that I had to go with a case just like this. You can see here, this is my VMware server, and that's my Unraid server. I chose to go with the Rosewill RSV L45 for you case for both, actually. This is by far one of the best bang for the buck for you cases that you could probably buy right now. The pricing does float around a little bit, but I was able to pick these cases up for about 130 bucks each, plus the cost of a pair of iStar USA rails. And as a side note, I have found the iStar Rail Kit to work really well with multiple brands of server cases in my rack. Your experience may differ, but I do like these rail kits. I'll have links in the description below. As for the horsepower in this server, I'm running a Supermicro X10 DRI motherboard, which supports dual socket Xeons. I can use either the third or the fourth generation Xeons and I can install up to one terabyte of registered ECC RAM. Currently, I have a matched pair of Xeon E5 2660v3 Xeons installed, and I've got a total of 64 gigs of registered ECC DDR4 memory. The E5 2660v3 CPUs are from the Haswell generation. They each run at 2.6 gigahertz base on all 10 cores, and the 2660s do feature hyper-threading. So since I have two of these installed, I've got 40 total threads to work with. In terms of the server's installed memory, I found 64 gigs was really the sweet spot between the mix of VMs that I have running and a little bit of breathing room for a couple more VMs down the road. And I have also been noticing that used registered ECC DDR4 RAM has been slowly coming down in price. You probably recognize the fans on these tower coolers. They're part of a Noctua heatsink kit. In order to cool these Xeons, I'm using the Noctua NH-U9DX-I4 CPU cooler kits. These heat sinks fit the LGA 2011 V3 sockets with either the square or the narrow ion mounting method. I believe this super micro board uses the narrow ion mounting and so do a lot of other server boards. The narrow ILM mounting does save space on the board. As you can probably notice, once the server gets built out like this, there isn't really a ton of free room on the board itself due to all the components added. These coolers do an excellent job at cooling the dual 2660v3 CPUs 
even under full load for extended periods of time. You can see that there are a ton of PCI Express devices installed in the server right now. The PCIe slots are really at a premium for me due to the size of the build and the amount that are included on the motherboard. You can see how I had to maximize all of the PCIe slots, which did require a little bit of creativity. I needed to pass through some USB 3.0 ports for one of the virtual machine projects. You can see that I had to use a PCI Express extension cable from an older mining setup to make use of that bottom PCI slot underneath the graphics card. It was a little bit difficult to route and get everything seated, and it really isn't that pretty, but it does work, which is really what I cared about. So that first PCIe slot connects to the riser, which connects to this card. And then the very next one that's sandwiched on top of it is an RX 480 8GB graphics card. This graphics card is actually being passed through to the same virtual machine, and that'll actually be a future project on the channel, so stay tuned for that. The next slot is blank. What I'm planning on here is basically installing a single slot graphics card in the future, or using a riser to relocate a thin graphics card to somewhere else in the case. Then we have a hardware RAID card. This is an IBM M1015 RAID card in the IR mode. I don't have a lot of storage in this ESX server, but that's basically because I'm setting up a FreeNAS server to host iSCSI storage space for this ESX server and a couple other future projects. There's eight drives connected to the RAID card, and the RAID array is a RAID 10 array. I chose this for increased speed, but still having a little bit of drive survivability in case one of them failed. And then you can see here that I have an extra SATA connection going to a three terabyte hard drive. Obviously it's a bit safer to run some kind of RAID array for the storage, but this drive is basically sliced up into different pieces for temporary and non-important storage for virtual machines. This is basically scratch space in a couple of VMs, so I'm not really too worried about the drive failing and then losing data. Anything important would have already been backed up. Moving on to the last PCI Express device, this is a dual port 10 gig ethernet network card. I have one of the 10 gig connections going directly to FreeNAS for the dedicated storage communication and I have the other 10 gig port that will eventually go to a 10 gig switch that I bought. I don't have that 10 gig switch installed yet. There are a couple of things I have to fix on it and get ready, so stay tuned for that as well. Eventually, I'll probably replace or augment the dual one gig connections. I'm not sure if I'll pass these through to a virtual machine for some testing or not. As you can see, there's a ton of stuff packed into this dedicated hypervisor, so I wanted to make sure I was using a quality power supply. At the time that I built this, just before the height of mining, the EVGA 850 watt P2 power supply made the most sense. This power supply is actually manufactured by a company called Superflower, and it seemed like the best balanced choice. While this is a consumer grade unit, it is platinum rated, so that means it's got over 90% power efficiency. Superflower makes great quality PSUs. This one, for example, carries a 10-year warranty through EVGA. The power supply is not redundant, as you might have guessed, because it is consumer grade. While this is a risk to system uptime and data integrity from the standpoint of the RAID card writing data, the redundant options for this type of power range were only available at a much higher cost. So this power supply was the best fit. Now that we have taken this time to take a look at this whole hardware configuration for the server, given that the newer AMD CPUs are extremely efficient and come in at a great price, and the answer to that is that this platform is really a enterprise-based platform. The motherboard supports registered ECC RAM, and it supports quite a bit of it, up to one terabyte. This type of server board also supports IPMI, which is a technology that can give you local BIOS level control to the server, but remotely from another machine. And all of this can be done through basically any kind of web browser. This feature has come in handy a ton. I'm always remoting in to make some kind of change, or if I have to troubleshoot, I don't actually have to physically go to the server. Since this server platform is based on Haswell generation CPUs, and they are a bit older, I did actually have to make a CPU upgrade. Originally, I was running the E5-2643 V3 CPUs, 
The E5 2643 V3 CPUs were 6 core 12 thread, and their real strong suit was the clock speed. It was quite a bit higher at 3.4 gigahertz for the versions I had for this server. Thread count was actually more important than raw clock speed, so I did swap those out for the dual E5 2660 V3s. This way I was gaining an extra 4 cores and 8 threads per CPU socket. So for these reasons, this server will definitely remain my main ESX virtualization server. But now that I've talked this server up quite a bit, I will say that I am planning on building an AMD Ryzen based virtualization server soon also. This server will have a slightly different role in my lab, but I'm excited to build it and showcase it here on the channel. If there's interest in going deeper into my ESX setup or any general lab questions, definitely let me know in the comment section below. Also let me know what you might like to see running on the new AMD Ryzen virtualization server that I'm planning on building. This type of home lab content is always super interesting to me. If it is to you, get subscribed to the channel and hit that bell icon below the video. You'll get notified when new videos hit the channel. Don't forget to check out the description below for links to parts and products that I used or would recommend on Amazon. You can follow me on Twitter at Sam's Tech Stuff, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Sam's Tech Stuff, or on the website, samstechstuff.com.